Good afternoon, everyone. This is our briefing on refer return to flight optics and imaging. And here to discuss the return to flight optics is Bob Page, the chairman of the NASA Inter Center Photo Working Group. Bob? Thank you, George. Um, as George said, I chair the uh, Inter Center Photo Working Group, which is a, a group of three labs, uh, one here at KSC, one at Marshall, and one at JSC, where we uh, perform the analysis on all the imagery that was that is captured for, of launches. Um, and then we go through the um, setups for all the cameras and make sure that, uh, that the imagery that we need is provided for us. As part of that, the Inner Center Photo Working Group has a, uh, a self-imposed uh, system that critiques the results of uh, image capture every flight. And so we review over what imagery we have every flight, and we go back and tweak the system to make sure that we get what we need. Uh, following the loss of Columbia, we gathered together a collection of the lessons learned, and we added to it during the in exit investigation to look at all the things that we felt that we needed in order to uh, provide uh, the system engineers the information they needed to ensure the health of the vehicle. About 24 months ago, two years ago, we began planning the, uh, the upgrades for the ground camera system. And about a year ago, I sat down with uh, Mr. Bill Parsons, the shuttle program manager, for a review of the proposal that we had put together. And he supported the addition of some things to uh, increase launch probabilities due to loss of a camera or weather conditions in addition to those things that we had already prepared for. Uh, it's been a busy 20, uh, 12 months since we uh, got approval from the program to go ahead with our plan, but with the assistance of some very capable, skilled, and resourceful NASA and contractor folks, uh, we're ready to support the launch of Discovery for 114. So if you go to my first pitch, um, this kind of shows you the overall shuttle imagery plan. You can see we're supporting uh, pre-launch, ascent, and on-orbit operations. Uh, we start at the upper left-hand corner with um, the baseline configuration imagery. This is very similar to what you all probably know about. It's called closeout imagery, um, but, and I'll get into exactly what baseline configuration imagery is a little bit later. Then we have the operational television system, which supports us um, all through the processing of the vehicle. We document all the things that happen to the vehicle in the OPS, the VAB, out at the pads. Um, but it really comes into play when we start tanking. And it's uh, the way that the uh, ice debris team and the final inspection team goes through and surveys the vehicle to look for uh, damage defects on the uh, external tank and ice buildup, et cetera. Then uh, for ascent, we have the ground fixed and tracking cameras and the new airborne tracking cameras vehicle mounted cameras, the new Elvis system, and then on orbit we have uh, orbiter cameras and the space station cameras. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the baseline configuration imagery. Uh, here you see uh, uh, pictures of the shuttle, the orbiter, and different colors on it, and the colors, uh, there's a legend at the bottom. Um, what we do here on the ground is we take pictures, high-resolution pictures of the external surfaces of the vehicle eight times better than what the on-orbit requirements are. So if they have a quarter-inch requirement on orbit, say for the RCC panels, then we take imagery that has a resolution of one thirty-second of an inch. Um, overall, we're probably talking between, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 pictures overall of the vehicle. Um, this includes not just the orbiter, but the external tank, the SRBs, main engines, everything. Um, we do this to document the condition of the vehicle in extreme detail before launch to help speed the process of the on-orbit inspection. So they, we have, they have ready pictures in hand to compare pre-launch with on-orbit. Um, during the, the ground processing, we continuously monitor the external condition of the vehicle for any changes. Um, an example of this is 
you know, you walk out of the mall and you walk to your vehicle and there's a big uh, spotted bird droppings on it. Well, we get on the orbit and that could look like tile damage or RCC damage. So we're continuously out there walk, on walk downs, monitoring the vehicle, documenting those things, taking high resolution pictures so that we can understand exactly what the condition of that vehicle was pre-launch. Um, and the high resolution issue is when you get the on-orbit pictures transferred to the ground, we don't want to manipulate the on-orbit pictures. If you, what you get is what you get from on-orbit, whatever the angle is. We may not have taken the exact same angle on the ground, so we may have to resize the image different directions, and you want to manipulate your ground baseline image, not the, one, the image from on-orbit. So next I'll talk about the operational television. Um, currently, we have over 100 uh, OTV cameras in use at the pads. Of these, we upgraded four of them for STS-114 to HDTV. That's uh, camera uh, 154, which is on the east side of the MLP deck. It's used to look at the, um, the locks umbilical and the feed line. We can do feed line scans with it. We see the ice build up in different areas. We can inspect different areas. It gives us high resolution of that feed line, the brackets, and the umbilical area. Uh, next is OTV-163. It's on the west side of the vehicle. We look at the LH2 umbilical with it. We can look up some areas on the feed line, but it's because the, the curvature of the tank, um, the tank's a little bit in the way for some areas on the feed line. Um, cameras 170 and 171, you all in the press are probably very familiar with these. These are uh, overall views of the vehicle. 170 is on the southeast side, and 171 is on the southwest side. Uh, depending on the wind direction, we'll zoom one of these in to look at the main engine start. Um, we choose the direction based on winds because it likes the wind will blow the exhaust from the main engines over in front of one of those two cameras usually. So we'll zoom one in the main engines, one you get to see the overall view of the vehicle. We have a planned upgrade for more OTV cameras for future launches. Uh, we include uh, OTV 160, which is up on the water tower. Gives us another area to scan the backside of the tank from. And, uh, and even more in addition to the, those five um, as needed to support the ice debris team and the final inspection team. Um, Another change we made in the OTV system was uh, camera 141 was moved slightly to provide a better view of the uh, LO2 feed line bracket at location X, uh, ET, uh, or I guess that should be XT1377. Uh, what we found in the walkdowns from the, um, the tanking test was now that we've removed the bipod ramps, uh, we can actually see the top side of that bracket at 1377. And so we moved the camera slightly so we can continuously monitor uh, any ice that may form in, in that area. Uh, next, I'll talk about the, um, the ground fixed and tracking cameras. Um, here's all of the uh, fixed film cameras that we have on the MLP deck. You can see um, there's 22 cameras here. And, uh, they all run at uh, high speed, 400 frames per second. They're all 16 millimeter film cameras. Uh, in each one, you can see on the list there what areas of the vehicle they cover. So we size the lenses in order to cover that, that area of the vehicle. Um, I have a show and tell. This is uh, each one of those cameras is in a glass container. And this is the quartz lens. Pass it around there. It's the quartz lens that the camera looks through. This one is one that was on a previous flight, and you can see the SRB residue that gets plastered onto it. And impossible to clean off, so we um, we don't reuse them. We throw them away and replace them every flight. Um, it's quite unnerving to be sitting in a film review sometime, and you're watching this to launch through this camera through this quartz lens and suddenly something flies at you and smacks into it and cracks this quartz lens. And we've actually had things go through this quartz lens and damage the camera inside. So it's a very dynamic environment on the MLP deck. Um, here's the cameras that are on the fixed service structure viewing the vehicle. And um, these cameras are also control uh, these cameras and the cameras that are on the MLP deck are all controlled by a POX 
control system remotely operated. That uh, the photo optical control system is in the PCC processing control center here on K at KSC. Now I'll talk about some of the trackers. Here's some pictures of uh, a couple of KTM trackers. Uh, this picture was taken before a test we did. Um, we we've hired a bunch of new operators to uh, operate the new camera sites and to drive the HD TV cameras. Focus is a little bit more critical controlling in HD, so we have actually two operators now on a tracker, one to run the tracker and one to control the HD TV camera. So we've been doing a lot of training, we've been doing a lot of testing, and uh, here we were comparing uh, optics and camera settings, and so they had them out on the test. They were tracking what's what we call high flyers, high altitude aircraft, and uh, they were also set up for an uh, expendable launch vehicle launch to, to practice on. And here you can see they, uh, them operating the KTMs, tracking some high flyers. Uh, would be nice to have that nice clear blue sky back again, but we hope we get something like that for launch. Um, this is a, a MOTS, it's a mobile optical tracking system. Uh, this unit is remotely operated. Uh, we use it at camera site uh, UCS-7, which is inside the blast danger area, so they, this camera has to be remotely operated. So we, um, we use this one system in that, in that location. Uh, and the KTMs are the backbones. So they're they're the, the big dogs, if you will. They uh, can handle 600-pound payloads on them, so they handle the big lenses for us. The MOTS is an intermediate. It uh, handles a 150 to 200 inch focal length lens. Uh, next is the, the if lot here. Um, this is a modified World War II gun mount. Um, it doesn't have the weight capability uh, of the KTM, but it can handle the optics for the, the medium range trackers. Um, it does a real good job of it. Um, of course, World War II gun mount, it's been around for a long time. Um, we're in the process of uh, replacing the motors and the transmission to these for um, better reliability in the field. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Playland of Domes. Uh, it's operated by the United States Air Force 45th Space Wing. Uh, it's a very reliable tracker and, and we get excellent data out of it. It uh, has a 200 inch focal length lens in it that we put a doubler on. So it's uh, effective focal length. It's a 400 inch focal length optics. And um, the uh, U.S. Air Force is planning on upgrading this to a HDTV capability for us in the next year, to year and a half. Uh, here's a picture of the telescope in that Playland the Domes. Um, the top camera you can see is a video camera. It has, a, I think it's a 60 inch focal length lens on it. And you can see the film camera just below that uh, mounted onto the 200 inch lens. Here is a, an ATOTS. Uh, this is also operated by the United States Air Force 45th Space Wing. There are two of these in inventory. Um, in the past, we've uh, only used one of them. We did a rotation. We used one to cover launches while they were refurbishing and checking out and doing servicing on the second one. Um, now we're going to uh, use both of them. And uh, I'll have a map up here in a minute and show you where they're going to be at. Um, these also, the Air Force is uh, going through an upgrade program to upgrade the uh, video on these to HDTV. In all of our planning, we, we used a lot of CAD models. Um, using uh, the CAD models, we could plan, we could change location on the range where, where a camera would be mounted, we could change the, the focal length, we could change the frame rate. Um, we, while all of our planned launches right now are 51.6 trajectory, we could go with different trajectories. We could we used ex, um, ran an extensive use of CAD models. This one in particular um, is a it's actually a movie. You just put in the parameters and it actually it plays the movie. Um, this was developed by the Marshall Imagery Group, and uh, it's it was quite a tool. However, there is always a however. Cloud models don't tell you everything there is to know about atmosphere and plume. 
So if you notice the picture in the lower left is about the same size vehicle in the frame as this picture, but the atmosphere and the plume really changed the view quite a bit. So that's what we're we're having to calculate in is is how you know where do you place the camera on the ground in order to not be looking up the plume and to be able to see something. So what we did was we laid out um, a set to give us what the cave asked for plus. And there's quite a bit of plus in this. Um, what we wanted was what was best for providing the engineers what they needed to know in order to to um, tell the health of the vehicle once, you know, as it ascended into orbit. And um, and then provide feedback to them on things that we needed to change, things we needed to fix for the next flight too. So here is the um, all the cameras that are inside the perimeter fence. Um, you can see in the um, in the field area, lower right and lower left, OTH 170 and 171. Those are the the OTV cameras placed there. Uh, up at camera site one in the upper right. Um, we have always had E60 there. We added uh, E65. We're focusing in on the tip of the ET to measure tip movement to, to um, provide the uh, loads community some information on the tip loads to the SRB during the uh, main engine firing. We added the tracker there with cameras E53 and E55 and an HD camera EH53. Next down is camera site two. We've always had a tracker there with uh, camera E52 and E54. We used to have an NTSC video camera there. We've upgraded that to HD. And we also added a fixed camera there, uh, E66, for the tip loads. So we have triangulation up on the tip of the ET during this movement. And then the rest of those cameras are all the same except for the tracker up at camera site six in the upper left, which we added HD on EH57. In this shot, um, you can see that we added a new camera site, UCS9, with E225 35 millimeter film camera and EH225, which is uh, HDTV. We're also running an experiment. We have a small tracking mount that we're going to set up there and run. We're going to put an HDTV camera on it and a couple of high-speed digital video cameras to uh, do some comparison imagery. At uh, UCS7 is the uh, the MOTS I talked about earlier. That camera site is in the blast danger area, so it's remotely operated from back at the uh, launch control center area. At North Beach, we added the high definition camera uh, EH222. Uh, UCS15, we moved that from UCS8 in order to give us a little bit better view, and we added the HD onto it. UCS17, we added a, a 70 millimeter camera onto this one. Uh, we used the 70 millimeter cameras as what we call the big sky view. Um, there's three of them, and if we had a, a Challenger type accident, then we can track things easier with a big sky view. Now, we don't normally develop that because of the cost, but we run it. We, I'm sorry, we don't normally print it. We run it, we develop it, and then we put it in the can. Now, we also added an HD camera onto that one, and then at UCS5, we added the HD camera onto that one. And here we have uh, the long-range tracking cameras. And uh, I realize this chart's pretty busy, but I'll try to walk you through it. Um, we'll go north to south on this one. A new camera site, Ponce Inlet, uh, with a new 35 millimeter camera and a new HD camera. This is a, a KTM, and it, its uh, location is the Ponce Inlet tracking station. Next down is Apollo Beach, where um, we have a 70 millimeter E201 
the 35 millimeter and the HD. This is a new site also. We don't have the infrastructure there to support that one, so what we did was we called a generator and a GPS for timing and we're set up and ready to go. Next down is Shiloh. We used to operate out of this site. Um, we're probably not going to since we have the two new sites north of that, but for the first two launches since they're daylight launches and to get as much data as possible, um, KSE ISTEF is going to operate a tracker out of there. Next down is UCS, uh, or excuse me, Playland of Domes, E207 and ET207, those we have always had and they remain the same until the uh, Air Force upgrades to HD. Then we have Shiloh, our UCS-11, which is a new site for an ATOTS. UCS-3 we've had, but we upgraded to e, um, HDTV. At 23 is the ATOTS, but we're also, the White Sands Missile Range is coming in with a tracker with a, a whole bunch of equipment on it. I've got five slots, so I don't remember exactly how many units that they're bringing. It's, it's maybe as many as seven. And uh, they're going to come in and do a bunch of digital imagery with a bunch of different lenses, a bunch of different camera types, and, and provide that data to us. Uh, UCS-1 is a camera site we've, we've never used. Uh, ISTEF is going to operate a tracker out of that for us. DVAR-R67 is a new one right out on the tip of the Cape. And uh, so we're going to run out of that with a 70, 35, and an HD. Uh, Cocoa Beach Domes, which got all the press before, is, uh, has been moved by the Air Force, so we've gone into that site with a KTM, so that's the new E-208 and E-H-208. And then Patrick Pygor, um, while Domes is being moved down to Patrick, uh, we're going to operate Patrick, uh, the Igor down at Patrick. So here, overall, and this is quite an eye chart, um, so there's hard copies available of this, um, goes through where the camera sites are, what's on them, and how many we're using. And I think the press kit actually said that there would be a hundred and, I think if you counted it, 107 cameras. We've now added the, the White Sands Missile Range experiment at UCS 23. So it's 107 plus however many that is. It's either five or six, seven. It's, so it's gonna be between 112 and 114 cameras total that we will have viewing the launch. And keep in mind that with over 100 OTV cameras, it, we record all of that. So at any time, we can always pick up that imagery also and go analyze that. And just like we had for 107's entry, the public and the press is also has their cameras set up and they've always given us that data if we ever needed it. So when, when I get asked the question, how many cameras, I scratch my head and try to figure out, well, how do I answer this question? So this is how many we have. How many total? I couldn't tell you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, next up is the uh, airborne tracking cameras. Um, here is the uh, picture of the, we call it the WB57 Ascent Visualization Experiment the wave. Um, Southern Research Institute in Birmingham designed and built the ball turret for us. It's a 32 inch ball. It has a 4.7 meter telescope in it. It operates, uh, it has an HDTV camera which is 720p60 and a near IR camera running at 30 frames per second. It tracks, we can track the vehicle from T0 all the way through loss of view, which for us on the ground becomes over the horizon, but for them at 60,000 feet plus, uh, it's a lot further than what we can see. Um, but we all need to keep in mind that this is an experiment right now. So we're, we're learning. This is all new. Our plan is uh, for the WB-57, it flies at uh, about 350 knots somewhere between 60 and 65,000 feet. Our goal is to be in a position approximately perpendicular to the flight of the, perpendicular to the shuttle at SRB set. We will be, as the graphic shows, about 
15.3 miles below and 15.3 miles to the right of in order to get as much of a 45 degree angle looking up at the vehicle as possible. Um, this graphic's a little misleading. Actually, at SRB SEP, the orbiter is underneath. So in order to look at things above the wing, you have to be more further, you have to be further out to get more of an angle onto the vehicle. If you get too close in, all you're looking at is the top side of the wing, and then you can't track debris, you can't track any other items or tell the condition of the vehicle. So it puts you out in the position that your lift distance is about 21.4 miles, give or take. Um, it's extremely difficult to plan this because of the ability, our ability on the ground to hold launch for up to five minutes. So if you're flying at 350 knots and you wanted to be at an intercept point in the sky at SRB SEP and we decide to hold for five minutes or four minutes, you can't stop in midair and wait. And it takes four minutes to do a complete circle at 60,000 feet with this plane. So we've gone through an awful lot of planning and working and talking with pilots and them figuring out exactly what kind of a route do they want to fly in order to be able to make sure they're pretty close to the point we want them to be at at SRB set. Um, so here's another view, a uh, plan view looking down on it about where the planes want to be. Now the, the access to this data, it takes about an hour for the planes to, after they, they get done with their mission, to descend from their altitude and land. Then we have to wait about another hour for them to safe the vehicles before we can start downloading the data. It takes um, about 35 minutes, 45 minutes to download the data off of the plane. And then we have to, if the planes land at Patrick, we have to drive it up here and then load it into the system. So about six to eight hours after launch is about when we'll get this data from the planes. So we went through quite a bit of planning. Where do they want to be? What angles do we want to look at them, et cetera? And so again, we've extensive use of CAD models to try to figure out where the planes are at. And you see in the upper left, the plane is the Z, and he's looking up at the shuttle, and you can see the shuttle picture on the right upper right-hand box. And in the same, you can't see it in the picture, but on the back side of the uh, shuttle, there's another plane over there, and that's its picture. Um, this takes into consideration sun angles, time of day, where you're at, whether you're late with acquisition, early with acquisition, whatever. We can play with all of those attributes during the CAD modeling. So here's what the actual article looks like mounted on the nose of the plane. You can see the telescope opening there. It's a 11-inch um, diameter telescope. So here, here's the WB-57 with the nose turret, um, and it's maiden flight, doing a little test flight. Um, about a week and a half later, they were doing some altitude imaging and they tracked this plane taking off out of uh, Intercontinental in Houston. Um, the most interesting part of this, not to me, not just the fact that they actually, that early, the backseater was able to track, zoomed in that much, but if you look below the lower right wing of that plane, there's a car in the parking lot. You can see his doors open, and there's a person standing at the at the car door. So we started scratching our heads and saying, well, what resolution do we really have out of these planes, out of these telescopes mounted on this plane? So we did another experiment. The guy was flying 350 knots from 60,000 feet, slant range of 23 miles, about what we would have looking at the, the shuttle, except 
course, we're playing with an awful lot of atmosphere here, looking down rather than looking up. And by the way, these images are JPEG, so the HD resolution is a lot better than this. But a couple of things to notice in this picture of tracking this T-38 taxi. Those yellow lines are about seven inches wide. And you can see those yellow lines very well. So that tells us one level of resolution. But on the wings of the T-38, those little black lines are two inches. So we're estimating that we're somewhere in the range of two to six inch resolution from these looking at in the 20 plus mile range, which we think will tell us an awful lot at, on launch. Because at being at 60,000 feet with the plane, we've, we've eliminated 90% of the atmosphere that we would have to look through. So here's another picture of the, the tracking. You see the people on the ground waiting for the T-38 to come up and park. So next is uh, the vehicle mounting cameras. And Christine Boykin, I think at JSC, went through most of this, so I won't spend a lot of time on these. The, um, on the left is the ET feline fairing camera. Uh, that'll be downlinked to uh, Myla. Jonathan Dickens Missile Tracking Annex, Ponce Inlet, and Wallops. Um, NASA TV will go through and pick the best feed and feed that out on NASA TV. Um, we will be d recording at those sites directly before it gets trans transmitted again, so we get the best high quality resolution, high quality recordings that we can, and those are then shipped to us in the uh, analysis groups. On the right is the uh, SRB mounted cameras that look over at the ET thrust panels. Um, those are recorded on the SRB and we get those about three days after launch when the SRBs are towed back in safe and then those cameras are removed. On the orbiter, um, we're still flying uh, in the lower left, the ET SEP cameras. Those are two Six, uh, 16 millimeter film cameras. They're still film cameras. They run at 240 frames per second. They actually run twice during ascent. The first time they run is at SRB SEP, and then they're, they're stopped, and then they start again at ET SEP. So those are high speed motion film cameras to get the, the SEP of the SRB and the ET. Uh, in the upper left, is the ETTPS camera. That was 35 millimeter film, and we used to have to wait for that, the vehicle to land and remove that. And a couple of days after landing, we finally get it developed and go over those. That's been upgraded to a digital camera. Uh, and along with the crew handheld and the crew handheld video cameras, um, the, after the vehicle is on orbit, the pictures are then loaded onto a laptop, and then I think it's now scheduled for flight day two. Those will be transmitted to us on the ground so that we can review all of those. The crew handheld still, the crew handheld video, uh, those are the responsibility of the backseat mission specialists uh, on the flight deck. They get up out of their seats immediately after DT set. They have to stand up grab the cameras and turn and look out the overhead windows. The vehicle does a plus X translation for the umbilical wall camera to take pictures of the ET and then immediately does a flip over so the crew can look out the window and take the pictures of the ET um, as we're separating away from the ET. And those pictures look something like these. The one on the left is the umbilical wall camera as we're doing the plus X translation maneuver and moving up the ET taking the high resolution pictures. The one on the right is the crew handheld as we're separating away and the crew is taking those, those pictures. Then the, um, the on orbit support, the orbiter cameras and the space station cameras, again, these were covered at uh, the JSC press conference, so I won't cover these much. Um, the orbiter cameras that have been developed is, the, of course, the boom system. 
Well, that's a laser imagery system for in inspecting the RCC and the tile for damage. Um, the imagery from the space station is a couple of digital DCS-760 cameras. Um, they take pictures of the vehicle during approach when we go through the R-bar pitch maneuver as we're going up the R-bar towards the space station. They flip over the orbiter so they, excuse me, so the crew can take pictures of the underside. Um, I actually did this when I was at JSC. They had a mock-up set up and you got a zero G and you tried to hold the camera. Um, they kind of set us up. They had one camera that was autofocus was working and the other one the autofocus was broken on. I got stuck with the one the autofocus was broken on. So it was uh, quite a job to go through and get good high quality focus um, on the on the orbiter as it was approaching if you have to manually do it. But they are good pictures. So we should see a lot from these. And this is mainly where we're using that BCI that I started with, that when we have to quickly go through all of the pictures that we have, the high resolution stuff from on orbit, and determine do we need to make a repair or not, this is this is where we're going to use that stuff. And we need, we because our time is very limited in getting that anal analysis done, we, we took those high resolution pictures to speed some of that up. So, Here's how we're going to move all this data around. And uh, the three boxes in the middle joined by the triangle are kind of the heart of the system. It's uh, the mirrored server. Uh, there's a large server here at KSC for the imagery lab. There's a large server at JSC and there's a large server at Marshall. They're connected with high speed data transfer lines. Um, the ground camera digital data, the HDTV. We bring it into the central data repository here for archiving, and then we dump it onto the mirrored servers, and the mirrored servers send it out. The same with the airborne cameras. When it's brought in, it'll be brought in here, dumped onto the archive server, and then put over onto the mirrored server and sent to the labs. We do that with the uh, EP and SRB camera data, also from the, uh, the crew handheld on orbit. That stuff comes in, comes in at JSC, we put on the JSC mirrored server, and it's mirrored to the other labs. So each one of the labs has everything that all the others have. Each one of the labs is independent, has its own approach as to how it does analysis. And so we get three independent plus integration. So four independent views and interpretations of that data. And it's my job then to pull those independent interpretations together and come up with one story to present to management. Over, uh, of all of this, um, we had a full system test on the 24th of March. We put all the field, cameras out in the field. We ran the HD. We ran everything. Um, we brought all that data in. We transferred all of the HD data to the labs in two hours. So two hours after launch, it was all there. And uh, since then, we've had quite a few sessions, practice sessions with high flyers, with uh, expendable launch vehicles, et cetera. And uh, we're ready to go and support launch. And that's all I have. All right. Thank you, Bob. And we'll take questions now. Please give uh, your name and affiliation when the uh, microphone comes to you. We'll start right here in the front. Hi, Mark Kirkman, Interspace News. Um, can you basically, big picture, tell me what kind of manpower, what kind of process your lab has to digest all this information and what stages it needs to be fed up to the program level? And also, just as a trivia question, are you saying from the wave you might actually be able to see Miko. Let's see. From the wave, it's a very good possibility we'll see Miko. Um, he will be traveling at 350 knots, chasing it. So it's very small compared to what the, uh, the shuttle's accelerating up to. But uh, being able to look over the horizon, it's a very good possibility we'll probably see him all the way through Miko. Um, Manpower. Um, in the lab here at KSC, we're probably going to have 30 people working, reviewing films and doing detailed analysis. Uh, at Marshall, I think they have 
about 20 or 25 people. And then uh, at JSC, they're working three shifts for the on-orbit, since they're the lead on the on-orbit stuff. I think that they're actually geared up to in the 40 range, 40 to 45 people working at JSC. Um, it's all brought together and integrated um, together by me um, to bring together one story. We we um, talk on the telephone. We converse with each other. We you know we're looking at pictures. We can say go to frame whatever, see this, see that, talk about it, and then uh, it's uh, my responsibility to present to the MMT up through uh, John Meritor and SE&I. Okay, question here in the right here. Hello, uh, Tarek Malik from Space.com. What is the, the hierarchy uh, when, when you're going to approach these images? Is it going to be, you're going to want to look at the, the orbiter first, you know, the the on-vehicle uh, on images, and then, you know, what's next, and how soon are you going to make that first report to the MMT? Um, well, we work them as we get them. So the first thing that'll come in, of course, is is the HDTV camera from here on the ground. That's the first thing we have. We're recording the. Um, if you if you know you go back and look at in the in the presentation, if you look at the eye chart, there are four OTV cameras that are HD. Those are recorded in the LCC. It's a matter of walking, um, actually. You don't even walk it. It's cabled up to the mirrored server system. So it's going from record mode to play mode and dumping it onto the mirrored server. So within 15 minutes, those are on the mirrored server for the labs to have. Um, then the, the ones from the field begin to come in, and we're looking at cabling direct a direct feed in for those, but we don't have that today, so it's how fast does it take the guy to drive that disk in, or you know, just pull the disk out of the recorder, drive over to the LCC, plug it in, and dump it up. Um, film, the film, which is our highest resolution product and, and our primary product, um, it's 24-hour turnaround for the first batch, which we have access to, um, and then 48 hours for the second batch. That's all the on-pad cameras. So all the fixed cameras that I showed you, all the ones inside the perimeter fence, because of safety reasons, we can't don't have access to them, so it takes a little longer to get them out. So um, then comes, uh, well, let's see, from the HD, then you have the probably the WB57 coming down, then flight day two, you have the the umbilical well and the um, and the crew handheld stuff, then. Then you're going to start getting into the boom stuff coming down, and so we're going to start looking at that. So it's as it comes in, we work it just as fast as we can process through it. Alan Boyle with MSNBC. I guess this is a follow-up in terms of the the time frame for the decision scenarios. It sounds like it's a continuous decision plan that you have to go through. But is there some point at which you would kind of make an announcement or make a presentation to the public to say, well, based on the imagery that we have from launch, here's the way we think the launch went, uh, and make that determination public? I don't know that it's my call to make that determination or when to make it public. Um, but I, I do know, um, I've been asked the question several times, well, when are we, you all going to get this HD imagery. Uh, our plan is when it comes in, you know, we take those drives, we bring them over to the LCC, we plug them in, we dump them onto the mirrored server. The uh, public affairs office here has some recorders. So once we've dumped it onto the mirrored server set, we pull that drive out, we walk over here, we plug it in, we dump it onto DVC Pro HDs, and we give them to you all. There is no time delay. There is no hold it back. There is no scrub through it. None of that. It's provided. Greg? Uh, some wave questions. Has Have the B-57 crews practiced against uh, expendable boosters? We had planned to do that, but both of the two expendables, the one here and the one out in the West Coast, both got delayed until after launch, so we never got an opportunity to do that. Uh, on wave, can you kind of characterize what everybody's discussed you would see in the event of an RTLS? You'd see the whole thing. Um, we would see the whole thing as long as the pilot 
was paying it was was running. I mean, we we don't know exactly where the vehicle's going to go. If you're a pilot up there at 60,000 feet, you know this thing's coming back towards you. You want to try to make sure you stay out of the way. So he's going to be trying to stay out of the way as much as try to keep the nose pointed in the direction, you know, pointed towards the vehicle for an RTLS so he can cover it. But that is a prime opportunity, that something that we could never get on from the ground cameras, is the powered part of RTLS. The uh, 107 cameras that used to be the 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 affiliation. Oh, I'm please. sorry. Yes, Bob Hager with NBC News. Uh, the 107 cameras that used to be in the press kit that you now say it's 112 or 114. What's what does that refer to? Is that the ground cameras, or is that the ground plus the air? Or? That's that's all of the cameras that the image analysis facilities get data from to do analysis of ascent. Of ascent, not on orbit. That's not on orbit. orbit. Okay, and is there a comparable figure for what it used to be before this mission? Roughly. I'd have to sit down and count it all out, but um, I, I haven't counted it out recently, so I don't have that number off the top of my head. It's, more. Oh, it's quite a bit more. Um, it's a lot more data for the labs to go through. Okay. John Tilko with MIT News Office. Um, you didn't talk much about the uh, plans for radar imaging from the ground station, the test that was done on the Messenger Delta II launch last August. And uh, could you talk a little bit about what that resolution would be? And I assume it differs based on whether it's a metallic object versus, let's say, a foam object for the radar cross section. Well, radar is not my specialty nor my responsibility, so I'm afraid I'd get myself in trouble if I tried to go answer for Tony Griffith and what the radar was doing. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think they're up running a sim this morning. Tracy Watson, you say today, not to stir up intercentral rivalry, but when you compare KSC, Marshall, and JSC imagery and, you know, try to integrate them all, how do they, you know, do they all pretty much come to the same conclusions? Um, yes. Um, their, their and, and, and that's one of the things I use. Their approaches are different. The tools that they use are different. But they all end up coming together with pretty close to the same answer. Um, it varies a little bit. Um, and, and it's, you know, one's not always right and another one wrong. Um, but when it came to 107, I mean, everybody's answer was was right on the money, and that was within you know, 20, uh, 48 hours after launch. In Los Angeles Times, um, I haven't heard you say anything about the issue that was in came up in Columbia. The Defense Department satellites up there are they doing anything? Or uh, I will not comment on that subject. Right, yeah. uh, do you know whether they're involved or not? I'd suggest you direct that to NASA headquarters. They might be able to handle that a little bit better in relationship with DOD counterparts. Uh, Bill Harwood. Uh, Bill Harwood, CBS. Uh, Bob, I got three questions, if I could. Can I use two-inch resolution? I mean, is that a real number? Is it like uh, kind of I would say I would characterize it as between two and six inch. Um, and part of it has to do with. How far away are we, you know, is it, um, do we hit T0 right on the money or did we have a little slip in that or are they a little, you know, uh, a couple of minutes it can be quite a ways at 350 knots from where you plan to be. Thanks. And, um, you know, just trying to think back to what the assets you guys had when 107 took off versus today. If you could think back to the day 107 went and that piece of foam that came off, if that same event happened today, what would this this array of assets let you find out about that? Well, I think that we would have um, much better accuracy in our measurements. Um, one of the reasons that the, the CABE, and I, and I talked with them about it, one of the reasons why the CABE said three useful views. Um, three, because your shutters are not open all the time. So if you're going to triangulate, you need two 
two locations. Um, three means that you're more accurate in when your shutters are open, how close together they are, because an object can, you know, move hundreds of feet in the time that the shutters, between shutter openings. So um, it, it's, it's um, I, I think we'd be much more accurate. Um, we'd probably be a lot quicker. With HD, um, we'd see a lot more in the quick look than what we saw before and, and might come to a quicker conclusion than having to wait the 24 hours for the film. Paul, well, I mean, what would you be able to say in this in that case with this with this equipment? I mean, would you have a view of the of the leading edge underside to see if something happened to it? I'm just trying to get a sense of the level of coverage you've got. Um, I I don't know the answer to that question. A uh, good possibility. Um, we just you know the wave is an experiment, so I just don't know how well it's going to do and, you know, I mean, that's a long focal length for the guy to keep it locked on to um, to the shuttle the whole time all the way during ascent and um, we'll just have to see. Steve? Stephen Young with spaceflightnow.com. Are there any scenarios where the weather might be go for launch but you might have concerns due to cloud cover or whatever that you won't get what you need during launch? Uh, we did a, a complete statistical analysis um, with the weather folks um, doing different weather patterns, different cloud decks, et cetera, and um, we didn't add any launch commit criteria changes for ground cameras because of weather concerns. Um, I mean, if it was a solid deck, we have LCCs already for that. So. You know, we're not going to lose ground camera coverage because of the solid deck. <clears throat> it's, um, I, I personally don't have any issues with, with any weather problem because the cameras are so spread out. The puffy clouds that we have quite often around here um, shouldn't be a problem. Okay, that's going to be the uh, end of our questions. And so we have another briefing following here in a couple of minutes. If you still need a uh, handout from the briefing, they're up here on the front, along with a couple of uh, fact sheets on the WB-57 and the uh, range optics. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome to the STS-114 briefing focusing on some of the propulsion system modifications that we've made for return to flight. Here to provide us an overview and status of some of those changes and improvements are to my left, Sandy Coleman, the external tank project manager. To her left, Neil Adi, chief engineer for the external tank project. And to Neil's left, Tom Williams, the deputy project manager for the solid rocket booster project. We'll hear a, a brief presentation from each of these individuals, and when they've concluded, we'll open it up for questions. Sandy? Well, thanks, June. I tell you, it's really exciting to be here. Um, we have worked for the past two and a half years, and, and we're finally here. We're ready to go. Uh, the external tank is certified. Uh, we have closed all of the paper. And so at this stage, we are reflecting uh, on the past two years and, and looking at those last a uh, few uh, rules and regulations that we're going to be following as we go for launch. Uh, as you know, we delivered the first tank uh, in, uh, on New Year's Eve, and uh, we rolled to the pad, um, and uh, we decided to roll back and uh, install a heater in the lock speed line bellows area. And uh, that has uh, provided the opportunity to uh, reduce the ice in that area. So. Uh, from that perspective, we're feeling really good about, uh, about the heater. We've, it's fully certified, ready for flight. Uh, arriving at Kennedy Space Center was really an emotional event. Uh, we've waited a long time for this. The team has worked really hard um, over the past two and a half years to get to this point, redesigning the tank to assure that we meet the, uh, the minimum debris requirements, uh, and, the, and the tank actually is, is certified to that. So uh, this afternoon we are going, Neil Adi, the chief engineer for the external tank, is going to present those changes that we have implemented on the external tank.
and uh, and then uh, Tom Williams will uh, present the changes that have been made on the solid rocket booster. And uh, then, like Jim said, we'll take questions from there. So, Neil. Okay. Thanks, Andy. I'm going to get up. Uh, I got some charts I'm going to be going through as well as some uh, show and tell over here. So I'll uh, stand up here and uh, roam around a little bit for you. It's much better. I've talked to the media several times over the last two and a half years. It is much better, I'll say, to be stuck standing here talking to you about what we have accomplished rather than what we're doing or what we have ahead of us. Uh, but I will start out by giving kudos to the uh, external tank team. Uh, that's something America can be very proud of is the way this team has performed over the last two and a half years. And I want to say I'm up here as the spokesman for external tank, but there's a lot of hard pe a lot of people who put in a lot of hard work over the last two and a half years who uh, can take great pride in what I'm going to present to you. Uh, to start out, let me see if I can get my charts up. There we go. Let me go back one. To start out here, I'm going to talk to you. The main challenge that we had for return to flight was to take a system that was designed 20 plus years ago, has been flying for 20 plus years, and to incorporate new requirements into that system. Typically, what you want to do when you're de designing a very complex system is you start up front with a good set of requirements, and then you can design to those. And in your design space at the beginning of a program, you got a lot more flexibility. You can change structure. You can change materials. You can, you can work on different configurations, different operational constraints, et cetera, in order to meet these various requirements. What we have done since the Columbia accident is that it has imposed new requirements onto the external tank, and now we're working with a system that's basically designed and trying to meet those requirements. And you can see the chart here it just shows you uh, the new requirements that we've got. Uh, we're starting with a, a allowable foam mass at the very big, uh, forward portion of the tank of 0 0.023 pounds, and that's, that's not very big. I've got right here, this is basically a 0 0.023 pound mass block of foam. And then down at the uh, aft end of the vehicle, we get up to a 0 0.075 allowable mass foam. So given the material that we're working with, these requirements uh, presented a challenge. So. That's basically what we've been doing for the last two and a half years, primarily is, is looking at the foam, working with the system as they define these new requirements. We looked at our vehicle, the external tank, to see what did we need to do and what changes could we make, make in order to meet those design requirements that we've got. Obviously, the first place we started was the cause of the Columbia uh, accident, which was the left-hand forward bipod. Uh, previously, the forward bipod, of course, was covered with foam. Uh, we had a ramp that extended out in the front of the, of the bipod, covered the uh, bipod spindle completely, except for one portion that, that would stick out <coughs> previously. Now, this is the same bipod fitting that we, we currently fly. It's the same fitting that we flew before. Uh, it's a titanium fitting. It used to be. Uh, on the vehicle. This would be completely encapsulated with foam. The only part that would be exposed would be this spindle right here. So at that point in time, the only thing we had to worry about preventing ice formation on was this spindle. And we did that with a, just a heater rod that went into the back here and warmed just this portion of the bipod spindle. <coughs> now, since we've eliminated the foam over the top of it, this is setting directly on the hydrogen tank, which is at minus 423 degrees because of the fluid inside. We had to keep this whole spindle warm. In order to do that, what we did was we added a heater plate underneath it, which was this heater plate. It goes right underneath the, uh, the fitting like this. Uh, there's an insulator between this copper fitting and the tank wall. Uh, and we have four heater elements that go into these slots right here. And what that does is serves basically now, instead of heating just one small area of the spindle, we're now keeping this entire spindle warm 
pre-launch in order to prevent ice formation. Now, the other thing that we had to worry about with this design change was not just preventing the ice formation, but obviously now we fly with this sitting exposed, whereas before it was covered with foam. So it's now subjected to different thermal environments during ascent. So we had to worry about the, uh, the heating of the, of the bipod spindle as, as we launch. Now that wasn't such a big issue because this is a titanium fitting. We did have different environments that we generated for it, and we tested it through these new environments. So we have more heating, but the, but the structure itself was capable of that, and we, we actually structurally tested it to failure. The only part we really had to change on the structure was the end cap that goes over this, this to close it out. We actually had to change material because of the higher heating. But that was the, the bipod. Now, I will say that uh, the guys that did this, uh, we started out, we had a lot of different design solutions. We started out looking at actually structures that went all the way over the top of it, uh, various different design configurations that we looked at. This was the most elegant and the most and the simplest one that we came up with. And the guys have done a great job of implementing that and putting it on the tank. Now, the structural... Just because we got rid of the foam ramp doesn't mean that we got rid of all of the foam. We still have to close out around the base of the bipod. I got some pictures here. Obviously, we started we started with the foam ramp here, but you can see that even when we're done, we still have to close around the base of this. Now, I'm going to touch a little more when we get into the flange on exactly what that entailed as far as the way we work with the foam and the way we lay the foam down and the rigor that we take in testing the foam out now versus what we did pre-Columbia. But let's suffice it to say at this point that as far as developing foam closeouts and the way we go about that now since the Columbia accident has changed significantly. What we did with the foam around the bipod which is basically just up to the level of the base of the bipod now. You can see here we actually did it in two steps. Here's the first step. We actually lay the insulator down. Uh, we foam a small area around it. We then come in with the wires that have to be laid down over that foam, and we bond that down to the structure, bond that down to the foam, put the fitting on, and then we come back in and we close out around that. Each step of this is, is the, uh, we have two sprayers now watching the foam going down. We have high fidelity mock-ups that we spray foam that look just like this sitting off to the side that we spray at the same time that we're actually spraying the flight vehicle. Uh, we cut that all up. We make sure that the process is still in control. So much more rigor in the process as far as putting down the foam. So that was the bipod. That was the first design change that, that we uh, started to work on. The other one is the uh, feed line bellows. This was identified early on as a potential uh, issue for the shuttle system, and that was the ice that grew on the, on the bellows location. Now, we actually have, you're going to hear a lot about the forward bellows location. We actually have three different bellows on the vehicle. One is up here in the forward which is the one that we have both, uh, I'm going to get to describing these, but we have both the drip lip as well as the heater on the forward location. The aft locations down here around the aft, we have strictly the drip lip configuration on. Let's go over here. This is a view of the bellows. The bellows are basically a, a, a flexure joint in the, in the line that allows the line to take up relative movement. As the tank shrinks due to the cryogenics that are going on board, they're able to flex, as well as during the structural uh, flexure of the tank during liftoff. What we had before was a configuration, and we got what we call one of our bathtub fittings over here. This is one of the test articles that we use. Before, this foam actually came down and was tapered here at the very end, and any condensate that ran down the line would come down over this slip, and it would run then diagonally straight in against this metal structure. And, then, and underneath here is a metal lip that comes out underneath the foam. And all that condensate running right down on that, that uh, cold lip, which is cold because this is the liquid oxygen line, and it's got liquid oxygen in it that's setting around 297 degrees 
below zero. So all the metal in this structure gets cold. And as that condensate would run down and contact this cold metal, it would grow ice. And it would grow a significant amount of ice. The first thing we came up with in order to mitigate that was to change the angle of the foam here. So now instead of the condensate coming down and being channeled directly onto this cold metal, it actually comes down. It comes down to this point, and you can see that it's chamfered underneath here, and it just falls off and doesn't contact the metal. That reduced the ice about 40% over what we were previously flying with and what we would previously collect on that bellows. As Sandy said, there just uh, uh, several months ago, as the system was going through the risk assessment for debris, they identified the remaining ice there as a concern. We had started working several other concepts in order to further mitigate the ice. One of those that we were working on and we had actually targeted to put onto a tank, which was going to be the third tank that we flew, was a, a bellows heater. And what that does, I'm going to do a bowl winkle here and watch me pull a rabbit out of the hat here. This is actually a heater that we designed. And what it does is it fits up into the gap here that is of the bellows. And it fits up. And part of, the, uh, part of the heater goes on the outer portion or the grain shield. Part of the heater is bonded to the inner portion, which is what we call the convolute shield. Now this actually flexes, and so that gap opens and closes as the feed line bellows flex. And this uh, connection here is, is just allows it, this rubber material just allows the two, two uh, heater elements to flex relative to each other. You can see we've got power that goes in between the two via these power strips here. And so we're able to supply heat to both the both of the metal components that are showing on the lower portion of that bellows. And what that does is it heats the air enough so that we don't get, we don't get freezing of, of condensate or moisture on those, those metal surfaces, and it keeps it free of ice. Now, I said on the chart here that it mitigates the probability of ice. As you see, the way we had to retrofit this is we got a split heater, so the guys actually wrap it around, put it up into the up into the gap. They put a little rubber bladder like a bicycle tire in here and they, ex they put adhesive on it and they expand it out to either side of the, uh, of the gap. And so it's bonded in place there. Now as you come around, you're going to end up with a small gap right here where they come together because the tolerances, we can't make it perfect and we always end up with some portion of a gap. You can also see the heater elements don't go all the way up to the very end of the, of the heater strip. Therefore, they have launched. What you may see is some pictures of one portion of this forward bellow that has a small portion of ice and then some frost around it. So that is normal. That's normal for the heater operation. Uh, it was uh, accepted by the, by the program as being under the allowable that they said would, would cause a problem. Now on the aft end of the vehicle, we don't have a heater. So what you'll see is the driplet alone and you'll see a formation of ice up under here in this cavity. Uh, and that has also been assessed by the program, and that has been accepted as acceptable for flight. So that was the uh, bellows story. And I'm going to have to keep track of this uh, clicker because I keep putting it down and losing it. Uh, next thing, the inner tank flange. The flange, I'm going to go back to the foam allowable now. The flange was also identified early on as a place where the external tank has historically lost a large preponderance of the time, about 60% of the flights, we have seen foam loss from the flange region. Uh, this was in excess of what the allowables came out as. Uh, there was times when we measured divots up to about 0.2 pounds from the flange location. Now, what we did here was somewhat of a challenge. I, I've got a, a mock-up here of the, of the flange here. Because, and the reason what made this so challenging is that we had to first understand the foam loss mechanism. This divoting mechanism that we saw 
Uh, we had some theories on exactly what caused it, but we didn't have the test data. We weren't able to duplicate it in test. We didn't have all the engineering that would allow us to just go fix it. So first we had to figure out what was wrong and exactly how it was, uh, was uh, the mechanism that was causing the divots before we could go fix it. So the very first thing that the, uh, the flange team did was to go into the test and start testing articles that looked similar and was built from the same hardware as the flange. And what they found was a very interesting phenomenon. What we have in the flange region is, is really a junction of, of two different structures. We have the hydrogen tank down here on the lower part that comes up. And then if you look inside of it, it actually has a dome inside that curves on up and away. So here at the bottom and coming out the back here, you have metal that is basically at minus 423 degrees. And that is enough to actually condense air and liquefy air and liquefy nitrogen. Now inside, this is the inner tank structure, which doesn't have propellant behind it, but it is purged back here in between this structure, the inner tank structure and the dome structure. It's actually purged with a nitrogen purge. So we, we put gaseous nitrogen in here to keep any flammable environment uh, within acceptable limits and to condition the inside of the inner tank. So what we get is as that gaseous nitrogen, which is in contact behind this structure here, would come in contact with the cold structure at hydrogen temperatures, it would actually condense that nitrogen and we would get a pool of liquid nitrogen laying right behind this structure inside between the hydrogen tank and the inner tank structure. And as you can see, you see these rivets, these high locks here. This structure is not a welded structure. It's a mechanically built structure. So it has holes in it. It has leak paths. And what was happening was as we chilled the tank and this, this structure got cold and it started condensing the nitrogen out, it would actually pull the nitrogen through these leak paths. And if we had any voids in the foam, that were in contact with these leak paths, it would pull that liquid nitrogen into it and it would condense it and it would be, that void would be sitting there full of liquid nitrogen or solid nitrogen, which was fine. It, that didn't hurt the foam at all. But what happened then was as we launched and as we flew and we get heating, both as the liquid level drops in the hydrogen tank and this structure starts to warm up, as well as heating on the outside of the foam, that nitrogen in those voids in the foam would then go back from a solid or a liquid into a gas and we get a large increase in pressure within the voids in the foam and that would blow the divots off because it couldn't get back into the into the inner tank fast enough because the the restriction in the leak path so fascinating physics uh, going on behind this divot and a lot of good work and a lot of good testing was, went on before we can even begin to solve the problem. So if you think back through that scenario, you had leak paths, you had voids in the foam, you had temperature dependency, you had the nitrogen on the backside. So then the question began, given that phenomena, given the physics of what's going on, how do we go fix it? Number one thing that we did was reduce the voids in the foam. As we dissected, a lot of these tanks and we found that the process that we were using to put the foam on previous to Columbia, we didn't have criteria on exactly how big a void we could actually build into the foam. It wasn't something that we thought was required. Obviously it was now. So we changed our process. Whereas before we basically had a two-step uh, closeout. If you see these uh, skin, these hat sections here, Basically what we would do before is we come along with a spray gun. It was a high output spray gun that the guys were manually using to put this foam on. They would stick the nozzle of the spray gun in here. They would shoot a mass of foam up into the, up in here to the stringer, which is hollow. You can see this foam protruding out of the, out of the hollow stringer here. And then as that filled up, they'd pull their spray gun back out and then they'd go ahead and attempt to close out all around here and move over to the next one and spray on and keep doing that and then just build this up in layers. A lot of things about foam, you got, you got overlap times you got to worry about. 
uh, you can't spray on, on foam that you've just shot because it's still expanding and rising. If you go right over it, you're going to get a weak bond. So there's a lot of criteria in spraying foam. And the old process that we gave these guys to spray it with just wasn't adequate to ensure that we had a good quality foam in there. So what we did was we broke it down into sections. Now what we do is we actually put a mold over this. We have an injection, a brand new injection uh, procedure that we have a hole right here in the foam. We actually inject a, a certain amount in a certain timed uh, foam injection into this. It rises up. You can see we're fairly consistent in the amount of foam we get in there and the amount of rise we get. And we let that set. That ensures that we've got a good closeout all around here. We've got a good closeout around these bolts that join the hydrogen tank to the inner tank. And this was one of the primary leak paths that we found were these bolts. It was coming up through the threads of a bolt. If you imagine a, a bolt that is threaded together and how that spirals up, the leak path, the hot nitrogen was actually spiraling up through these bolts. And if we had any void associated with the end of those nuts or end of those bolts, it would pull nitrogen right into those voids. So what we've done is we, we turned these bolts around. We put them up top here. We encapsulated then the nut and threads with this injection here. Then we come along and we do what we call the top closeout, which we mask this lower part off and we do a, a spray of these lowers. And we start over at one side. We build the foam up slowly, layer after layer, making sure that we got we now have two sprayers watching the spray, one guy doing it, one guy watching. We have a quality inspection inspector also looking, measuring the overlap time, measuring the, we got guys down at the uh, spray pump that are measuring all of the, uh, all of the uh, parameters, make sure we get a good spray. We're also videotaping, so we can go back and look at any of these sprays and see exactly how they did it and were they within the proper configuration, proper technique. So we do this top portion. We trim it off, and then we come back, unmask this lower portion, and we do the lower, lower portion. Like I say, we have new process controls in all of these. So given that, when we go and dissect all of these new sprays with these new parameters, significantly reduce the number of voids that we have in, in this uh, foam structure for the flange. So, and we then took this exact same process. We build up test panels. We took it back through the test arc the test profile where we found the original root cause and they performed very, very well. So we believe that the, uh, the flange foam is, is going to behave very well. Uh, we've also, in addition to that, like I say, we, we did change the uh, bolts around. We did in select places, if you look at this real close, you can find, you can see places where there's leak paths that come through there. We actually take a little syringe before we start putting any other foam on and we inject a little, little bit of foam into each of those little leak gaps so that we can reduce the number of leak, leak pads that we have at, out underneath the foam. And it performs very well. Now, one thing, I'm going to go back. You're going to hear a little bit about what we call the protuberance air load ramp, uh, the, or the PAL ramp. Uh, that's actually a foam ramp that is placed up alongside the cable tray here to prevent any uh, aeroelastic instability of the cable tray. Now you can see on this picture, you see this nice shiny white piece of, of ramp. We actually took it off, and the primary reason we took it off was not because we had an issue necessarily with the ramp or the foam in the ramp, but because we wanted to get to this flange closeout that went underneath it. So we actually took off 10 foot of the hydrogen protuberance air load ramp so that we could get to this uh, flange closed out under here. We closed it out and then we had to develop a new process and certify a new process to put this forward 10 foot of power ramp back on. So every time you do one thing, it gets you into something else. So that was one where we actually had to go beyond just the flange and it drove us to another piece of foam that we had to go do uh, a new process certification on. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about is our ET camera. Of course, we've all heard about the uh, increased uh, video coverage that we're going to get both on the ground side as well as the flight assets. 
this is our contribution to this. If those of you who've been following space program will know that we flew a camera on the external tank back for STS-112. What we did was we picked up that same camera design, but we did change locations. Whereas before, it was actually further up on the liquid oxygen tank and actually mounted on the outside of a cable tray, this time the camera is going to be mounted inside the fairing that closes, that, that encompasses the uh, liquid oxygen feed line. It's mounted up at the top. You can see it's got a hole cut in the back of the fairing for the, uh, for the camera. And here you can see the view that we're going to get. Kind of a distorted view, but you see we will be able to see the bipod, be able to see the uh, liquid oxygen feed line, a lot of the inner tank hydrogen tank foam, as well as portions of the underbelly of the orbiter. Uh, this was, like I said, we basically picked up the same hardware that we used on STS-112. Uh, here's the camera. We did have to do a little modification to the mounting bracket and mount it a little bit different, but the electronics box, the antenna, the camera, all of this hardware is the same hardware that we used for STS-112. And with that, that concludes uh, my portion, and Tom Williams is going to give us a briefing on the SRB, I believe. Thanks, Neil. And, and for those in the shop that that uh, say Neil has aged 10 years over the last two and a half, I'm, I'm here to correct that opinion. I don't think he's aged a, a day over five years in the, in the, in the last two and a half years. Uh, welcome to Kennedy Space Center. Welcome to America's spaceport. We've got a uh, beautiful spaceship out on the pad, and it's launch ready. And I'm, I'm sure Sandy and, and Neil would agree with me when I when I say we're, we're very proud to represent two outstanding teams that have, that have worked very hard over the last two and a half years to get us here. That's, that's the Lockheed Martin team, the USA team. Uh, that's the engineers at Marshall. Uh, not only engineers, but technicians across the program, uh, support personnel, and, and as, as important, the families that are out there supporting the teams that are that are going to work and, and working the many hours to, to get us here. There's been a great number of sacrifices on the families, and I wanted to say hats off to, to all those people across the, the program that, that have allowed us to do our work and, and get us where we are today. So uh, with that, I'd like, I'd like to get into some of the items that we've been working on over the last uh, two and a half years on the SRB project. Uh, I've, I've talked to you people uh, in the past about the bolt catcher. I'm going to touch on that a little bit, but I would like to give you an overview of some of the other areas that we've been working on. So if you'll bring up the, the first chart, please. Uh, in the debris world, we've, we've done uh, uh, impact tolerance testing with foam and ice and some of the blader materials on SRB hardware to demonstrate impact tolerance and damage tolerance to worst case debris uh, predictions. We've also done a lot of work in our thermal protection systems. Neil mentioned that the foam. Uh, we use uh, other insulated materials to protect our hardware during the ascent phase of, of the flight. And so we've done a, a lot of testing to make sure that those materials were certified to the environments that they're asked to perform under during the ascent phase. Uh, in the pyrotechnic devices, the, uh, the pyros are what we use to uh, provide separation events, the, uh, the release of the frangible nuts that allow the vehicle to come off the launch pad. Those are pyrotechnic devices. Uh, we also have uh, uh, frangible uh, bolts that, that fire at T plus two minutes to allow the, bo uh, the boosters to separate from the external tank. And in that area, we've actually made some, some design changes. In the separation and deceleration uh, subsystems, the booster separation motors, some of you uh, may or may not be familiar with the booster separation motors. Those are the motors that fire. There's, there's eight of them on each booster, four on the forward and four on the aft that, that fire and allow the uh, 
the boosters to separate from the external tank. We've uh, redesigned the igniter in that subsystem and we've done a great deal of testing in the BSM throat. In a few moments I'll, I'll walk you through some of those some of those details. Obviously the bolt catcher, that was a cave item. Uh, they asked us to address the safety factors in that subsystem and we've done so. Imaging and instrumentation, we, we too have uh, some, some cameras, two, two cameras, one on each booster uh, that will be looking across the external tank, inner tank uh, region. Uh, and we'll have that data to provide the imagery engineers to, uh, to assess the, the performance of the tank in the inner tank, uh, the flange region that, that, that Neil mentioned. Uh, the ET attach rings. Those are two structural rings that go around each booster. These two were K-bottoms, and we've done a great deal of testing to make sure that we meet requirements uh, relative to the structure for the ETA rings. We've also made some uh, minor modifications in the aft assembly relative to the fuel isolation valve connector, uh, and we've done some testing to make sure we understood the environments uh, in the aft assembly of the solid rocket booster. Uh, next chart, I'll, I'll talk about some of the non-hardware changes. As, as you may know, the solid rocket boosters are retrieved by two retrieval ships. They're brought back to Cape Canaveral. They're towed into uh, Hangar AF, where they're brought out of the water in teams of engineers from the solid rocket motor team, as well as the solid rocket booster team. Uh, spend a lot of time going from stem to stern on these, these boosters to make sure that the performance was within the requirements. And we'll, we'll be looking at those boosters with a little different eye this time. Uh, with our sensitivity to debris, uh, we've improved our requirements relative to the inspection of those, those boosters. So we'll be uh, looking at, at those boosters for any potential debris impact areas. And we've also improved the uh, the, the participation of the team that goes over those boosters. We'll have people from across the program that will also be looking and inspecting the boosters and participating in the decisions and any findings that we may, we may uh, see during that post-flight assessment. So we've got uh, people across the program that will be participating in that post-flight assessment. Uh, relative to the retrieval ships, uh, we've got a new Weibel radar system on one of the ships. In conjunction with two radar uh, systems that will be land-based, we'll have one on the retrieval ships that will uh, provide debris tracking during the ascent phase. So in conjunction with the, with the land-based uh, visible imagery systems, the ascent imagery systems, and the uh, space-based imagery systems, we have the uh, radar systems that that proved to be beneficial during the 107 investigation, and we've we've uh, we've got one on our retrieval ships, and so that's that's an improvement from our debris uh, assessment standpoint. And with that, I think I'll uh, I'll walk you through some of the the show and tell that we have. I've talked to you guys uh, extensively about the bolt catcher. I won't talk a, a, a great deal about it. It is. It is the uh, it does exactly what it says. It's a bolt catcher. It's uh, the, there's two uh, pyrotechnic bolts that attach the, uh, the the boosters at the forward end of the ET attach ring, and they fire, they break, and it allows the boosters to separate. And the way uh, we capture those bolts are, are in this, are, is in this bolt catcher. It has a honeycomb system on the inside that allows the bolt to decelerate. And, and it captures the bolt so it doesn't become a, a debris issue. And so the CAG uh, recommended that we, we improve our safety factors in this, this area. And so what we've done, we've changed the alloy to increase the strength. We've doubled the thickness. We've increased the, the size of the fasteners that, that fasten the bolt catcher to the ET ring. We've also decreased, we've actually decreased the density of the energy absorbing material so what that does, it actually reduces the forces that the bolt catcher has to withstand. And this is a this is a sectioned bolt catcher that has actually had a bolt fired into it, and you can see the amount of margin that we have in the, uh, in the bolt catcher device. 
some of the, the debris impact testing, I've, I've got a, uh, a sample of what, what's called a range safety system antenna cover. Uh, the range safety system antenna is an antenna that's on the booster. It receives commands from the 45th space wing in the event that we, 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 uh, a destruct signal is, is issued to the vehicle. The range safety system is the, uh, the antenna is the system that receives that signal. So it's a very important device, and this is a cover that protects the range safety system during the ascent phase. It actually flies in this direction. And you can see uh, some of the debris impact testing that we've, we've performed in the solid rocket booster. We've uh, performed over 400 tests with either foam, ice, or blader material. And this is a sample of a, a 15 gram uh, uh, foam projectile that we used in our debris impact testing. We we fired the, the foam at, at several different angles, and and uh, we've used that to calibrate our models so that we can use those models to predict all various cases of impacts due to ice and and uh, and foam. Here's here's a particular case where we did actually see some minor discussing of the insulation on the range safety system. So what we had to do in this case, and this is, this is a test case where we bounded the, uh, the, the foam velocities and masses to, uh, to, to impart the maximum energy into this, this particular piece. So this is a worst case kind of test. But we did see some scuffing on the insulation. So what we had to do to make sure that we were impact tolerant or, or uh, damage tolerant to those foam impacts, we actually had the electronics inside this cover when those tests were going on. And so after the test, we took the electronics off and, and took those electronics through uh, the acceptance checkout to make sure that 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 those uh, that antenna and that circuitry was was still performing per the specifications as if it were were new. We also then would take a piece like this and put it under. Uh, hot gas testing at Marshall Space Flight uh, Center, uh, which simulates the thermal loads during the ascent phase to make sure that this minor damage to the insulation didn't affect the temperatures within the box. So whenever we had uh, a piece that exhibited uh, any sort of damage due to debris impact testing, we had to go do uh, additional testing to make sure whatever its intended function was not affected by the debris impact. Uh, Neil talked a little bit about the cameras, and I, and I understand this afternoon you'll get some more uh, on, on ascent imagery. But we do have the two ascent uh, imagery cameras that are in the forward skirts of the SRBs, and that data will be captured in a, uh, a data acquisition system that, that's similar to this box box here. And when we get the boosters back, we'll download the uh, the imagery data handed off to the imagery analysis team for, for their assessment. These two cameras, uh, are, they're actually housings for cameras that are going to fly on STS-115. This will be a forward-looking camera on the ET attach ring looking up underneath the orbiter. This is an additional camera that's going to be mounted on the forward skirt that will be looking aft. So we've got cameras looking across the ET and then we'll have cameras starting for STS-115 looking underneath the orbiter from both uh, the aft position and the forward position, and it'll complement the, the ET imagery in the uh, LOX ferry. Uh, let's see, the last, last thing that I wanted to talk to you about is the uh, booster separation motor. Uh, the booster separation motor is about a 30-inch long solid rocket motor about 13 inches in diameter, provides about 18,000 pounds of thrust, and as I said, there's, there's eight on each of the boosters that push the booster away from the ET at, at separation. And this is, a, uh, we had a technical issue that, that our engineers uh, uh, decided we wanted to tackle. It was a, uh, we, in the past, we've had some minor cracks that occurred in the uh, graphite uh, throat of the booster separation motor. We've experienced two over the life of the program. That's that's out of uh, several thousand booster separation motors, and the cracks are, are very small. And from a performance standpoint, 
uh, it's not an issue. They're, they're, they're very small. The, uh, uh, the, the booster separation motor fires for a grand total of eight-tenths of a second. So the, the, the thermal and structural issues due to that phenomena were not a technical concern. But with our new emphasis on the debris, we wanted to make sure that what we were flying on 114 and subsequent vehicles were not susceptible to those those minor cracks that we had experienced in the past. So we embarked upon a, a, a highly technical uh, issue that was that was tough to crack, very very much like what Neil said. We had to first understand the physics of the problem. So we had to we had we ran over 900 tests to to develop. Uh, uh, physics-based models so that we could predict when and what attributes would create a crack in a, in a graphite throat. And what we learned is that the, uh, the bond line thickness between the graphite throat and the housing was a, was a key parameter. So what we did, we, we developed a, a, an inspection technique to, to evaluate those throats, the ones on the forward uh, portion of, of 114. So we can make sure that that bond line thickness was thick enough such that we didn't create stresses that, that created a crack. The material strength was also uh, an issue, so we did a great deal of material testing. Uh, we did tests to recreate the problem so that we could demonstrate that we understood, understood the physics. Uh, and so uh, through that testing, we were able to assure ourselves that for 114 and subsequent that we we did not have an issue relative to the throats on, on 114 and subsequent flights. And with that, that's, uh, that's all I have for today. You know, across, across all the projects, this is just a sample of, of, of what we've been working on in SRB. And, and Neil and, and, the, and the motor guys, as well as the engine guys back at Marshall, have been busy working. Uh, various issues just like the ones that we've described today and, and this is just an overview of some of the more significant items but uh, we haven't been just twiddling our thumbs over the last two and a half years we've been working very hard to address not only the cave items but items that our engineers in our own shops had questions about and where there were questions we made sure we had answers for all of those so in closing we've got we've got a, a, a vehicle that's that's on the launch pad. We've provided the best hardware that we know how to provide. We've got a launch team that's ready, and we're anxious to get our feet back off the ground. So I'm, I'm, I'm ready to take questions, and that, that's uh, all I have for today. All right, Tom, thanks. Uh, we have time for uh, some questions. Um, if you'll please state your name and affiliation. Also, please wait for the microphone. Uh, we'll start uh, right here in front with Jay. Jay Barbary with NBC, a two-parter. What have you done to assure that we won't have smudging on the cameras uh, as we had, I think it was an STS-12? And also, uh, Neil, could you tell us how much pound-wise or percentage-wise that you've uh, reduced the foam on the uh, external tank? Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the first one, the, the smudging on the camera. If you remember the STS-112, like I said, we had it mounted on the cable tray, uh, and it was higher on the vehicle, uh, and it was as we flew it, uh, it became quite obvious we had it in direct line with the uh, BSM plume impingement, and, and so at booster set, basically we lost that view because of the smudging on the camera. Now we are. We have moved that. That is one of the primary reasons that we actually moved the camera when we put it into the LO2 feed line fairing. Uh, they have done transport analysis with the uh, BSM plumes. Uh, they have looked at that, and the, all the analysis says that we have moved it to a location where it's going to be shielded from impact by the BSM particulate. So we, uh, we believe we're going to get a clear view all the way to orbit. Uh, as far as the amount of foam reduction that we've done on the tank, uh, percentage-wise, it, it, it's almost uh, very, very insignificant, almost in, incalculable. Uh, the only foam we've really taken off, uh, change in configuration, is the bipod ramp. And so, you know, we're talking a couple pounds out of, out of a number of hundreds. 
So percentage-wise, uh, we're flying virtually as much foam as we've ever flown. But we do have a lot more faith in the foam than we'd had previously. I'm Keith Darcy with the Times Picking in New Orleans. My question's about the uh, 10 foot segment of the uh, PAL ramp um, foam that was removed and put back in place to give you access to the inner tanks uh, segment. Um, on previous flights, have uh, you guys ever removed that much foam from a tank and then replaced it prior to flight? Uh, we have had we, we have what we call nonconformance uh, areas before where we have in, and what happens there is as you're putting foam down uh, maybe your parameters go out your temperature range goes out uh, for whatever your, your spray gun acts up for whatever reason uh, and and when that happens we have no choice but to remove that foam and then lay it down and get it back within operating uh, process parameters. So during normal build, normal processing of the tank, uh, we have removed and replaced foam in, in virtually about every area. Uh, we've even stripped entire inner tanks before and taken them back through during build. So we have removed and replaced foam before. Uh, a full 10 foot of towel ramp, uh, I don't know if we've removed that much, but I do know we have removed power ramps. Well, in fact, I'll, I'll say I do know we have removed entire LO2 power ramps, uh, liquid oxygen power ramps, uh, previously during the normal build process because something went out of, out of control. Hi, Mark Kirkman, Interstate News. I have two questions, one booster, one ET. Um, you talked about uh, some of the changes in the aft uh, skirt area with regard to the isolation valves and the uh, purge. What, what necessitated those changes? What are those changes? Well, we had a, we had a fuel isolation valve that uh, was given a spurious signal uh, prior to 107. It was a, a crit three kind of uh, event. But what we wanted to do is uh, eliminate that potential and, and what we what we had there was a 90 degree connector that was uh, providing intermittent contact so what we've what we've done is gone in there and redesigned that connector uh, and the GN2 purge was uh, part and parcel to that that investigation there's a GN2 purge that's provided in that vehicle that portion of the vehicle to uh, to uh, eliminate any hydrazine hazards in that area, but it's a pretty high flow rate. So uh, that, uh, along with the potential for somebody to maybe kick that 90 degree connector during operations and maybe uh, create that, that, that signal issue, we went to a straight back shell connector, which is, is less susceptible to mechanical vibration and less susceptible to uh, to, to somebody uh, uh, accidentally bumping that and, and creating that, that loose connection. So we did a lot of testing with the GN2 purge to understand what kind of forces was, was, was created on the FIV connector. Uh, and then we redesigned the, the FIV connector itself. Uh, Bob Hager with NBC. I, I noticed that I think I've got this right, that the output from one of those cameras on the ET tank, I think it's a bipod camera, comes back in real time, uh, whereas the cameras on the SRVs uh, await the recovery of them in the, uh, in the sea. So I wondered what, why the difference, what the considerations are there, and how long does it take to, uh, uh, how many days after launch do you get the pictures from the recovery of the SRVs? Well, let's see, the, uh, the SRB, uh, We'll, we'll be in port with the uh, with the boosters two days after launch, and, and then on the third day we'll be able to get in there uh, and get that camera uh, imagery data to the ascent imagery folks. So we're looking at at L plus L plus three time frame. And what are the considerations? And, and I wondered how come one camera gets the picture back in real time? Is it something to do with the well, position or all or the importance of the camera and the other one doesn't? Yeah, if we, if we waited till the tank came back in the port to get the picture, <laughs> we, we, we'd be waiting a while because we throw it away. So if we don't down, if we don't downlink from the external tank, uh, that, that's the only way we have to, to obtain the, 
obtain the video is, is via a downlink. And the system, the system we're using for 114 is a system that we've used in the past to uh, to evaluate the inner tank region before, and it's used. It's been uh, a proven system, and it's been very successful. So uh, we were happy with the performance of that on previous missions. So we're going to we're going to we're going to maintain the status quo with that system. That's great. Uh, Craig Cavall, Aviation Week, looking for kind of a, a, a quantitative answer here on ET. With all the various imaging capabilities you'll use, in addition to kind of a good qualitative assessment, can you characterize the kind of quantitative uh, measurements you'll be able to perform with the imagery you expect? On any insulation effects and so forth. Uh, uh, are resolutions you, and so forth. Are you looking for quanti quantification of, of the uh, of the video and exactly how big a piece we'll be able to see? Or well, I'm sure I'm sure the materials guys know some have some idea of what they will be able to pull from that. So if you can characterize that beyond just it looks good, yeah. And, and that is one thing. As I said, we're using the same camera system that we used on STS-112, and all this all this uh, hardware is really commercially off the shelf or what we call COTS hardware. So this is cameras, uh, electronic boxes, batteries, et cetera, that, that we picked up from vendors and, and have packaged into a system that we can use. The frame rate and the resolution on this camera is not not to high definition by any mean. Uh, so an event that happens very quickly or a very small piece of debris, uh, we could easily miss it with the ET camera. Now, of course, we have a lot of other assets in place. Yeah, I really think, I believe Tom said that we had a briefing this afternoon. Yeah. I, I believe that question probably be, be better asked in, in that form. I think they could give you a view of the entire system uh, better than I could. Well, not not to beat the dead horse, but I've had the briefing. Uh, it's it's from a materials characterization point of view. When you look at the various assets imaging that you'll have looking at the tank, is there some metric that uh, the individual materials guys are working toward with an idea they'll be able to, you know, give you a pro con on a yeah. more than just a qualitative. Right. I, I think what. If I can answer as best that I can, the main thing that we're going to be interested in is, is if we can get a handle on exactly what kind of mass loss that we have. So we're going to be looking at uh, anything that we could see during ascent from the ground cameras or that we could see from the, the flight assets, as well as one of the main things the tank's probably going to be looking for is the umbilical cameras uh, where we get the best view of the tank after it gets to uh, after it separates and is on orbit and we're going to be looking for missing foam and to see if we can size those areas and and ascertain if we lost foam uh, what was the mass of that foam from that particular area Tracy Watson had her hand up for a while Tracy Watson, USA Today, I think from Mr. Audie. Um, can you tell us where you'll e expect to see ice still besides that little part of the driplip? Are there other parts of the tank, you know, acreage foam or umbilicals or something, where we, sh we should be aware that you might see ice? Yeah, uh, as ice, we, we uh, the program does have an ice criteria that they have established uh, that the ice team inspects for. Uh, that's all documented in a program level document. Uh, areas that we would expect ice is those areas where we have movement, basically, in in the structure that that you have to allow the structure to move to flex. That is the uh, feed line bellows is one. Uh, the brackets that hold the liquid oxygen feed line onto the hydrogen tank. Uh, there has to be relative movement between the hydrogen tank and the liquid oxygen tank. Those areas we we will expect to see ice. Uh, we see ice uh, around bond lines, uh, uh, foam bond lines in certain locations, and that is because the uh, the material we use when we lay one foam closeout on top of another foam closeout, it has a different thermal conductivity than foam itself, and so you can get a get a, a little bit of a heat le heat leak through those bond lines, and and you can see uh, lines of ice, lines of frost in those locations. Uh, we have some other areas back at the aft end 
uh, on the orbiter to external tank umbilical. Uh, that is an area where we would expect to see ice. Uh, the feed line in between the hydrogen tank and the orbiter uh, also uh, has bellows in it and we'd expect to see ice. So the programs looked at all those areas. Uh, they went through an assessment of all those areas and deemed them acceptable per the criteria that they've documented. I think we have time for one last question. Here with, uh, Dan. Dan Billow from Wash TV for Neil. Uh, do you have any paperwork that still needs to be closed? Uh, can you tell us if, if we will be seeing on OTV cameras any close-up looks at, at the bellows or uh, places where ice will form during the terminal countdown? Will that, do you think that will be punched up on, uh, on the live feed? And could you also, if I can get away with kind of a long question here, could you also talk a little bit about what, what you'll be doing, what you'll be thinking, and, and what will be going through your mind as you watch this ET camera all the way up? I assume you can watch it up to separation. Eric, uh, we, we have our paperwork closed. Yes, all papers closed. Okay, so, so that's a good thing. Uh, as far as the, uh, the media coverage, I, I, I know that the ICE team area, how much of that is going out on uh, NASA Select? Uh, June, I, I don't know. Uh, I can't answer that. Uh, certainly, we will be looking at it. As far as what I'm going to be uh, thinking and feeling, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I, may be, uh, I, I may be jumping up and down and shouting, but uh, actually, I, I think, now that you asked me that, I think we'll celebrate when we get the crew home. I think until that time, uh, we're going to watch it and uh, take pride in what we've done, but know that we're not done until they get back. All right, thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Our next STS-114 briefing is scheduled to start at 3 o'clock. Uh, it will be focused on uh, return to flight imaging. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Launch Minus Two-Day Countdown Status Briefing for STS-114. Here to bring us the status today is Pete Nikolenko, NASA Test Director. Good morning. Scott Hickenbotham, the STS-114 Payload Manager. Good morning. And Kathy Winter, Winter, uh, Kathy Winter is the Shuttle Weather Officer from the Department of the Air Force. Good morning. And we'll begin first with Pete Nikolenko. Pete. Thank you, George, and good morning, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here today to provide STS-114 launch countdown status for the historic return to flight mission of the Space Shuttle Discovery to the International Space Station. I'm even more pleased, though, to report that the STS-114 launch countdown is in progress. At this point, the countdown is on schedule, and we're tracking no significant issues. The launch countdown did begin counting yesterday evening at 6 p.m., and last night we completed avionic systems checkouts. This morning we're working preparations for the servicing of the onboard fuel cell cryogenic tanks, which is scheduled to begin this afternoon. That operation is expected to take about seven hours. Once we get back into the pad later tonight, we'll pick up with main engine system checks and pad closeouts. Our other standard countdown activities include Check out of the Orbiter and Ground Communications Network, which picks up Tuesday afternoon about 1 p.m., rotating service structure retraction at 7 p.m. Tuesday, and the external tank load, which is scheduled for just prior to 6 a.m. Wednesday morning. Following the ET load, we'll continue with preparations for a flight crew arrival at the pad early Wednesday afternoon. The launch window is approximately 10 minutes in length and will open at 3.45 p.m. on Wednesday, July 13th. During the T-minus nine-minute hold, we will then sync up to our actual T-0 time based on the day of launch parameters. And we typically target the middle of the launch window, which correlates to the 3.51 p.m. time frame that you should be aware of. This mission is a 12-day mission with two weather contingency days, and end of mission landing is scheduled for here at KSC, at approximately 11 o'clock Eastern on the morning of July 25th. 
prescribed turnaround plans, as was mentioned yesterday, we do have our standard 24-hour and 48-hour scrub turnaround option capability, which means that we can get three launch attempts in prior, in four days prior to standing down for the servicing of our fuel cell reactants. And the launch window opens approximately 23 minutes earlier each day. In summary, all our hardware and systems are performing nominally. We're currently tracking no technical issues. And our launch team here at Kennedy Space Center and support teams from around the world are ready and looking forward to returning the shuttle Discovery to flight, to returning to the International Space Station, and to safely returning our astronaut crew back home. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. And now to payload manager Scott Higginbottom. Thank you, George. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm happy to report I have a very brief but very sweet summary for you this morning. All of our hardware is onboard uh, Discovery, closed out and ready to fly and we're not working any issues or concerns at this point and uh, remain ready to launch. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, but just as a reminder relative to scrub turnaround, our hardware is very insensitive to time. There are no significant perishable items on board and we're quite content to sit on the pad as long as it takes to get this mission off the ground all the way through any launch opportunities we may have out in September. So we're buttoned up and ready to go. And that's all I've got for you this morning. George? Thank you, Scott. And now to the shuttle weather officer, Kathy Winters from the 45th Weather Squadron. Kathy? Good morning. Well, Dennis has moved out of the way now. Uh, he's moved off to the north and there's just tropical depression. And now we are looking to launch. So looking forward to launch day, we do have a ridge building in uh, north of our area. So that's uh, what that does is puts us in an easterly flow pattern where the winds are blowing from the southeast. And that should, as the sea breeze forms, push the sea breeze towards the west. And what that does is as the sea breeze forms, we usually do get showers and thunderstorms along the sea breeze, but it will be migrating to the west. So during the launch countdown, we may see an isolated shower and an isolated thunderstorm uh, pop up, but the, that sea breeze will migrate to the west and by launch time uh, should be off to our west. And of course, the launch pad is on the coast. We also have that concern within, uh, for any thunderstorms or showers within 20 nautical miles of the shuttle landing facility. So right now we are forecasting a 30% chance of KFC weather prohibiting launch due to that. Let's go ahead and look at the, uh, the satellite picture. You can see we do also have a new tropical depression, tropical depression number five. Um, if that storm does become a named storm, it will be Emily. Uh, the Hurricane Center is forecasting for that to become a hurricane uh, by Friday and uh, move up towards the area of Hispaniola by Saturday. That's our next area to watch in the tropics. Uh, right now it is pretty far away. Models are uh, all handling it somewhat differently, so there's a lot of uncertainty with that storm. So right now we're just keeping an eye on it, but right now it would only be an issue for us if we happen to uh, scrub the launch all three days. And moving to our uh, launch forecast chart. Uh, you can see uh, we do have a good weather, expected scattered skies generally. Now again, during the countdown, we may see some weather, but it should migrate to the west. The main issue will be any showers or thunderstorms within 20 nautical miles of the SLF. And with that, we have a 30% chance of KSU weather prohibiting launch. If we do happen to delay 20, uh, excuse me, we're going to also, that was our, was I, I'm sorry, that was our tanking forecast. Our tanking forecast looks good as well. We have a 5% chance of violating tanking constraints. We do happen to delay 24 hours. They're going to help me out here. Thank you. Um, we will uh, expect to see a little bit more uh, thunderstorm activity in the area. It could be a little bit closer to us. And with that, we have a 40% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. And uh, let's go ahead and look at the 48-hour forecast. We're going to do this in a different order today. Uh, similar weather expected. We're just concerned that ridge may be beginning to migrate to the south. And with that, we, uh, we think those chances of the thunderstorms being close to the SLF are possible and also having uh, uh, some showers and thunderstorms in our area near the, near the launch pad as well. So with that, again, we have a 40% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. And just I'll just do a brief uh, summary of the Cal sites and the Kona sites. In general, we're watching Northrop each day for the chance of showers within 30. And also at the Cal sites, Marone, we're concerned about crosswinds for each day. And uh, finally, we do have one chart on the uh, hurricane, or excuse me, the tropical depression number five that's forecast to become a hurricane. There's the uh, forecast from the National Hurricane Center uh, over the area of Hispaniola again by Saturday. And again, this would not be a concern to us unless we were not able to uh, launch during the week this week. 
And that's all I have. Are there any? Well, I guess we'll get some questions here. All right. Yes. So we'll take uh, questions now. Please give your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you. And we'll start here in the front with Jay. Jay Barbary with NBC. Pete, uh, will you will you adjust on launch day the 351 uh, launch time to station location? And do you, if you're going to do that, do you expect that to be in seconds or in minutes? Uh, right now, we're baselining the countdown for the window opening period, which is at 3.45 p.m. Uh, during the T-minus nine-minute hold, we will adjust off of that T-minus nine-minute, uh, at the T-minus nine point from the 3.45 p.m. Uh, window opening time, which would then be on the order of five minutes and some odd seconds, which would adjust to that uh, three-minute or 15.50 uh, local time frame plus or minus some seconds. So it, it, we're baselining off of 345, not off of 351. Marsha? <clears throat> Marsha Dunn, Associated Press for Kathy. Um, since the hurricane is weakened so significantly, has that, the forecast is still the same. Has that had no impact whatsoever on what you're predicting over the next several days? So far, it hasn't. We were expecting it to weaken when it went inland, and so mainly our concern was how it was going to affect the ridge. So we're just a little bit concerned still that that ridge may slip to the south. If it doesn't, some of the models are forecasting for the ridge to stay to the north. So if it doesn't, we may end up improving those numbers. But in the meantime, we weren't totally confident in that just yet, so we bumped the numbers just a bit up for the 24 and the 48-hour forecast. But right now, we're still confident in our, our current forecast of the ridge being to the north on launch day. Is Dennis still sort of playing into that where the ridge will be? Well, it's, 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 up, it's far enough up to the north that the ridge is, is kind of getting us back. We're kind of getting back into our typical pattern, if you will. So it does play in the overall picture, uh, just like all weather systems do. But right now, it's mainly, we're mainly, we mainly are getting back into our typical weather pattern in the summer and just watching the placement of the ridge to see if the thunderstorms move to the west or they move to the east. And in this case, they're going to move off to the west. Bill? Bill Harwood, CBS for Kathy. Uh, your forecast, and with, I can't remember, it's been so long, but you don't include SMG's RTLS in your 70% number, is that right? Yes, we do, actually. You that do. Is, so 70% is, incorporates RTLS because I was wondering about crosswinds and all that. Yes, it does. We aren't concerned about crosswinds because of the uh, southeasterly flow uh, basically coming almost up the runway. So uh, we're not concerned about crosswinds. But uh, that number does include RTLS landing weather and launch weather at the launch pad. Chris? Uh, Chris Kreiber from Florida today for Kathy. I know you're hoping that the shuttle will launch before Emily becomes a problem, but at one, po at one point, do you start talking about high winds and the potential for rollback? How many days before Emily's arrival? Usually, when, two days uh, before the arrival of 40 knots of sustained wind is about right. So, about the 48 hour point is when that all the press would need to begin. So. Um, basically, that would put us on Saturday on that last point. We're about 51 hours out, so we're getting close to that two days it's on Saturday at 2 a.m. Irene? Thanks. Um, Irene Fox with Reuters uh, for Pete. Could you talk a little bit about what's being done today with the, um, all the cameras um, all over? And um, if you could just review again what needs to be operational um, for launch as far as the launch commit cr criteria? Sure. Uh, today we've got crews that will be going out to the uh, meeting long range camera tracker sites, verifying that the equipment setup is in place, and then prepare for uh, film installations tomorrow. Uh, for launch day, we have no, uh, there is only one launch commit criteria for the uh, functionality of the photo optical control system console in the, in the um, launch control center. The camera sites themselves are not a launch commit criteria, that's just part of the program requirements document. We do have uh, daily status checks that are that are relayed forward to the test team and then to our management to uh, status the uh, functionality of all the camera systems all the way up to and including uh, the about an hour prior to launch. Yes, back here. Good morning, Peter King, CBS News Radio. This is for Pete. I'm just wondering, it's been uh, two and a half years since uh, you've launched a shuttle. What are some of the things besides uh, TCDT that uh, you all do to keep the uh, uh, launch crews fresh and keep them from getting rusty over uh, that kind of layoff? 
We've really been quite busy, uh, especially over the past uh, uh, year and a half, following the, the Columbia recovery. Um, we ended up performing several launch countdown simulations for the launch team and, uh, and also with the flight control team in Houston and the supporting center at uh, Marshall and, uh, and other centers. Um, we've also had several mission management team simulations that also exercised uh, the launch team and the flight control teams as well. And we've been averaging those on about uh, a frequency of about once every six to eight weeks. So we've had somewhere on the order of well over a dozen simulation, launch team simulations uh, since about June of uh, 04. So we've been quite busy. Okay, we'll take one over on this side of the room. I'm Alan Boyle with MSNBC.com, and I had a couple of questions, maybe one for Pete and one for Kathy. Uh, has the crew come back, Eileen or anyone else, come back to keep their skills uh, uh, in, in good practice for some reason working with launch hardware here? And then for Kathy, um, is there any scenario or any model that you've worked up in terms of how long uh, whether, for example, if tropical depression number five does develop into a storm that comes into this area, is there a rule of thumb about how long a delay might be? I'll start off first. Uh, the, the, the crew has been training nearly constantly. They, had, they did return back to uh, here to Kennedy Space Center on the 30th of June for a uh, final payload day walk down before we close the, uh, the, the uh, payload day doors for flight. Uh, and they, in fact, even today, I believe we're going to be getting another uh, walk down uh, with, uh, with just a look at some of the equipment that they'll be using. Uh, I can say that they have been uh, quite busy, and I think, I think it's safe to say that their skills are quite sharp and that they're ready to proceed. Well, you could probably talk to the delay, too, Pete. Uh, I know that uh, to, to bring it back in, it's about two days you need, and, and then it depends how far you go down in those preps and if you actually had to roll back. So there's a lot of different scenarios there. Um, the number I gave, I gave 51 hours. That's just an average 14 knot speed from that last point. I should make that point. But, Pete, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit more about the time of the delay. Sure. Certainly, we'll... Uh we're going to be getting together a lot and talking if we were to enter into that scenario. Um, what kind of a delay that would turn out to be really is difficult to ascertain. I think um, I would like to keep the, the flavor more positively and, and optimistic in hopes that we'll get off the ground and launch on Wednesday before we talk about some uh, uh, what-if scenarios. But uh, suffice it to say that we're going to be looking at it quite closely. I think we have a question in the back of the room here. Uh, first, for Kathy. I'm going to say, please, please give your name of television. Okay. Greg Dobbs with HDNet Television. With respect to the weather, in addition to the meteorological conditions you require, are you insisting and requiring perfectly clear skies as far as the eye and the television cameras can see on the launch path to observe the shuttle as long as you can? That's actually a mission management team decision, but I am providing information during the countdown for uh, Mike Leinbach, the launch director. I'm providing him information on what kind of cloud cover we have, and I can also provide him satellite pictures. And then what he, what, uh, he does is he takes that and they, work, uh, they talk about it with the MNT and discuss uh, the assets they have as well. And they put all the whole picture together as opposed to just looking at the cloud cover. But it will be something that, is, that they are looking at uh, for the imaging. Uh, for imaging purposes. Can you characterize the cloud cover they uh, cannot tolerate? There's not a, a hard and fast uh, number for that because it, one cloud, one area of clouds, even if it's just two-eighths coverage or one-eighths coverage, could impact uh, uh, several cameras. So what we do is we look at it real time and look at how the clouds are, are, are in relation to the cameras. And then that's what the mission management team will be using to make that decision. So it's important for them to bring that in with the information on which cameras are functioning and, and, what, you know, and the, the overall status is really what's going to help them make that decision. I asked the other question, and perhaps having just stepped into the room, it's inappropriate for any of you, but can you explain the uh, special manipulation of the shuttle shortly after launch for the purpose of observation? That it's going to do a flip of some kind. 
Uh, that's the, the, the maneuver that's performed during the uh, rendezvous with the International Space Station. They'll do it. Is that the flip you're talking about? No, I, I, I read okay. from a reporter of all things that it's a flip shortly after launch for the cameras on the ground to be able to see portions of the shuttle that they wouldn't normally see uh, during its outward path. Okay. I mean, is it, is it separate and apart from the normal role? Uh, I'm not sure we have the right people here to, to answer that question. This afternoon's 4.30 briefing can probably answer those questions a little bit better. Uh, let's come back up here to the, uh, to the front. Okay, Stefano. Yes, Stefano, Polygraph for Popular Mechanics. A uh, quick question for Mr. Niklenko. Um, is photography um, an LCC constraint for launch? Uh, no, it is not. It, uh, the, the ground imagery system is, uh, it, right now we just have it listed in, uh, in our program requirements, and it, uh, as Kathy mentioned earlier, uh, would just be, uh, we'll talk about it with the mission management team on launch day, but it's not a launch con uh, constraint. So if you can't see, I mean, if you cannot have a view from, uh, I don't know, some camera, you still can launch because you have others? Uh, is that the reason? We have expanded our suite of cameras both within the pad, medium range, and long range to uh, uh, sufficiently be able to capture three useful views either from the north or from the south such that we expect to get uh, uh, good film coverage during the ascent phase of the, of the launch. Okay, Irene, a follow-up and uh, that will be our last question. Uh, thanks. Um, I actually have two. Um, the first is, I think, just a quick one for Scott. Um, has there been any last minute or what passes for last minute in this business request from the Asian program to uh, put anything else on the shuttle? And um, I don't know if this is uh, who did that to answer this other one, but with an 87 degree temperature and a 70 percent relative humidity forecast at launch, what sorts of winds would be best to avoid ice buildups on the tank? Okay, for the first part of the question, there have been no last minute changes to the uh, complement in the mid deck. Clearly, the complement in the payload day was frozen a long time ago. Um, one of the things we were preparing for, however, was in the event that the, uh, the two SIPA, the current place of later units, weren't going to be ready, we had backup cargo ready to take their place. But uh, they passed uh, all of the uh, testing necessary to get cleared for flight, and those are indeed flying. So. Uh, that hardware that we had prepared as a backup will go back in the queue and maybe fly on the 121 mission. All right, as far as the remaining briefings today, we have four that will be on NASA TV. At 11 a.m., there will be an International Space Station Processing Overview with Scott Higginbotham, the payload manager. At 2 o'clock is a shuttle processing overview with John Cowart, the JSC resident office manager. At 3 o'clock, a discovery processing overview with the discovery vehicle manager, Stephanie Stilson. And then at 4.30, or as soon as the L-2 review concludes, will be the STS-14 pre-launch readiness press conference. Thank you very much. Okay. Live pictures there of some of the effects of Hurricane Dennis. We're going to join the coverage of our sister network, CNN USA, Anderson Cooper and John Zarella there. They just took quite a lashing. Let's listen into what they have to say. Exactly. Or, or if you should start making preparations for something else. It's gotten so light out here yeah. again. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a very, very strange and eerie feeling. Um, Chad Myers is standing by CNN meteorologist in Panama City. He can maybe explain uh, what's going on not only where he is, but what's going on over here and how long this thing is going to last. Chad, how are you doing? Yeah, uh, good afternoon, Anderson. In, in fact, you didn't even get the worst of it. I know what you experienced was, was really bad, but people on the other side of the eye, the eye that actually was moving forward, they got it a lot worse. Obviously, we don't have pictures from there yet, but we will. What we're experiencing here now is the storm surge coming up and coming over onto the seawall and every once in a while splashing over the top. 
<sighs> now I can talk because I'm in the shadow of a, of a big building. It's so different from one side of a building to the next, and that's what we're seeing here. In fact, the winds are coming different directions, as you say as well. They're now coming more on shore. As they come on shore, we're losing some roofs across the street. And as that happens, those pieces now, they become projectiles. They get into the 85 mile per hour winds. Our last gust was 84 miles per hour, and we're 40 to 60 miles from the eastern side of the Iowa. So everyone from here right on through and on up to Destin and Fort Walton Beach all being affected like we are and in many places a lot more than we are. The problem with a lot of the spots here, those buildings are 12 to 15 stories high. The higher you go, the higher the wind speeds. If we had 84 down here, they had 100 up there, 150 feet off the ground. The big difference about what you're seeing and what I'm seeing, I'm getting a windstorm. I will concur that this is very dry. Now, I'm as wet inside as I am outside, but that's because I've been out here for six to eight hours. The difference is what we're seeing here is the wind. What the wind is doing to the trees, knocking them down. We have had over 15 inches of excess rainfall here in the past month. The ground is absolutely saturated. That was some sea foam. Try to get that off there for you. The ground is absolutely saturated. As that happens, the wind is just taking these trees and pushing them into the power lines, and power lines are sparking everywhere now across the city. As the winds come straight in from the ocean, and the pressure is still falling for us, so we're still getting closer and closer to the center of that low pressure or the center of what will be the easternmost or the, the three, maybe 30 miles east of the easternmost eye wall. Anderson? Chad, thanks very much. We'll check in with you again. Again, this thing, this is a very fast-moving storm, John. Uh, it, it, it seems like it may have already, the worst sort yeah, of may have passed it, us. It sure does. Those hurricane-force winds that sustained that we had at the worst of it. Now we're on the other side of the storm, and uh, although we could still get some some pretty intense gusts here, it sure does feel as if at least uh, the, the, the worst of it's over for us here. We don't want to, though, you know, send out, the, uh, frankly, we don't have the information yeah. of exactly where this storm is. So if people are listening in the Pensacola area in their homes you know don't suddenly get, get on the road thinking the worst is over uh you know wait till you hear uh you know let's we'll talk to jackie jarrison a little bit we'll get some more information of exactly tracking where this storm is uh and, and where it is moving to uh because even though it, it, it has gotten better here somewhere else and you know worse. you have power lines that can be down and those wires can be can be uh, be hot wires yet and i know that happened back in miami in a category one hurricane uh back in the late 90s and uh uh four or five teenage boys went out to play oh. and they were all electrocuted wow. and uh, because they thought it was it was over but there was standing water right. and there was a power line a hot line and so you just do not want to go out. There's just too many dangers out there. We haven't, uh, you know, obviously because we've sort of been in the thick of things, we haven't been able to get a lot of uh, information from authorities about uh, uh, power loss and that sort of thing. The last figure we had, which is several hours old, is that 130,000 uh, uh, people uh, had lost power in Florida. Uh, I, I would imagine that that number has risen uh, dramatically at this point. Jackie Jarris is standing by uh, for us at the CNN Weather Center. Jackie, where is uh, Dennis and, and where's it going? Well, at the top of the hour was about 15 miles. To All right, we leave CNN USA there, and we go to Guillermo Arduino. He's been tracking as well Hurricane Dennis, and it looked calmer where Anderson was. Is that because they're in the eye of the storm? Absolutely, or the yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Um, Anderson was in Pensacola Beach, and Chad was in um, where was Chad again? In uh, Panama City Beach. Right. Now. What's going on there, half an hour ago, it was the other way around. It's because now Anderson and John Zarella are under the eye of the system. And actually, uh, Jackie Jeras was saying that the center, according to the National Hurricane Center, is 15 miles or roughly 21 kilometers northeast of Pensacola. I'll show you that in a minute. First, let's locate them. So we have Panama City. This is where Chad was. And then we have Pensacola over here where the other guys were. And the system is, the, the eye is actually over here, like 15 miles northeast of the area. So the worst is over. But let's see, it's already inland and we still see a very defined center of the system. The other th situation, I've been talking in CNN Spanish on the air with actually Harris Whitbeck, who is in Panama City as well, and he was saying, well, the second half of the story is going to bring a lot of rain. Yeah, fortunately, this time the second is not as large as the first half. So we're going to see bad weather, of course, all the way to Mobile, as we're seeing now. 
But Pensacola and the area, already the worst is over, and this is going to start improving gradually. But the storm is not over, so conditions here are now coming to a standstill for a minute, and we're expecting a lot more. Don't go anywhere. CNN and I will be back in a minute with more news.